I don't even remember doing January. <laughs> well, it was a okay. while back. Are we on? Are we good? Yes. Well, I still see the circle circling. Does the circle circle? Uh-huh. There you go. All right. So, hello, everyone. Um, hey, can somebody do me a favor? Because I'm not sure this thing is working right. Could somebody just maybe email me and say, hey, Chief, we see you? Uh, oh, wait, not email. <laughs> you know, send a message. Um so no, listen, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is our, our chat with the chief for the month of February. It seems like a long time. I know there's a pretty good distance between what we did in February and back in, in, in January. But um, uh, I got to go home and see my, my folks up in Ohio in the Cincinnati area. They had about 12 inches of snow up there. So I uh, made sure my mom and dad were able to shovel the driveway. I watched them, supervised them. They did a great job. Um, but I, I remember those days growing up. So uh, it was good to get up to see them and, and then get back here, uh, back home here in, in, in Newport News. So I appreciate individuals uh, chiming in with us. And what we'll do is we'll spend the first few minutes um, just giving you a little bit of update. We'll talk about where our crime is. You know, we had our end of the year press conference. We'll talk about our annual report that's getting ready to come out. Um, but we will, uh, I want to, I'll talk to you about what the crime is currently today where the city stands. I think that's important to get that information out. Um, and then I've got a couple uh, things I want to touch base with you on. Uh, some things I've been able to be a part of here in the community in our city. Uh, what's going on in the police department and what's coming up, right? And then some things that we're doing uh, down the road and in, in, in the future. And then I do have a special guest with me today. And I'm going to introduce her to you here very, very shortly and talk a little bit about what she's going to bring to the table. So, um, Jamie, we're sure we're, we're sure we're good, right? All right. We've been on six minutes, and I ain't seen any messages come up. I see them on my end. Hold on. Uh -oh. <clears throat> you think we got one? So I just want to make sure we got this thing working. I didn't touch anything electronic today. I didn't mess with anything. <clears throat> I didn't unplug nothing. Um, but if, if you don't write in a question, you just got to sit and listen to me, and that's going to be for a long hour. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. But I can make... I can do some knock-knock jokes. Oh my gosh. So, all right, so look, so first thing for the city, today, um, currently, if we reported our numbers to the FBI, uh, the city is, is over a 25% reduction in crime today. Today, we're down 25%. Um, that's our property crime and our violent crime. Um, so we're trending in the right direction. I know we're only about uh, seven weeks into the year, but I can tell you that seven weeks in the year, we were 25% up, we'd have to make some drastic changes. Um, so I'm not saying by any stretch of the means that we're across the finish line or anything like that or if we've knocked it out of the park. But what I'm looking at right now is our strategies and our deployment and the areas we pick to select um, is, is paying off for us right now. We have about a 25% reduction in crime for the city uh, today as of uh, what uh, the 25th of, of February. So uh, the other, other thing I'm really excited about, we've got our high, uh, high school. We've got our... Uh, recruit graduation coming up March 25th, and, and I, I, I cannot get here fast enough. We've got 16 outstanding individuals that will graduate. Um, matter of fact, later today, I will meet with Chief Grinstead, and we'll kind of have a discussion about uh, how we're going to divide the recruits up into the precincts. And then tomorrow morning, we'll spend about three hours, and you'll see it's like the NFL draft. Uh, the three precinct captains will make their selections uh, of the recruits to come to their precinct and work with them. So I'm looking forward, uh, I'm looking forward to that as we, as we move forward. Uh, and then my hope is, and we'll let the recruits know probably Monday, um, where they're, where they're going to be assigned. I'll send the captains over to the, uh, to the, the academy and let the recruits know what precinct they're going to be working in. Uh, so on, on the back end of that, um, we have a class of 24 that just started the academy last week. So 16 that are getting ready to graduate. Another 24 that will start in the academy now is about seven months. We've included some different training, uh, incorporated some different training into our academy. Uh, I think that helps prepare us and it's part of the national conversation, how we communicate with people. We're still focusing a lot on mental, mental, uh, uh, mental health, uh, on autism and different things that I think we need to pay uh, some more attention to. I want to increase some of the hours on. Um, we have some training coming up about uh, enhancing our, our street level investigations, how we respond, um, uh, those type things uh, that, that are going to take place in the precincts. Um, so, so we're really spending a lot of time this year in 2021 on, um, on training. 
Um, so like I said, 16 graduate, we've got another 24 that started, and we've already started recruiting for our academy that will take place in May. Um, right now, uh, our numbers, we are only about seven or eight individuals short of being fully staffed. So with that, um, in that, in that position, we only need about seven or eight uh, more more positions that we can hire. Now, I imagine by the time we get to May, uh, I would anticipate the, the class in May will be about 17 or 18 uh, that'll put us where we need to be. So that'll be our third acad or second academy for the year, and then we'll even we'll run one more towards the end of the year as we move into 2022. Uh, our young adult police commissioners, that's a, a group that we work with. It's a freshman, <coughs> sophomore, junior, and senior from every single high school that we have in the city. Um, so freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, they work with uh, Captain Tejans, Lieutenant Morgan, and Community Youth and Outreach. And uh, it's a group that we work with every Wednesday. We spend about three or four hours um, uh, uh, together, and we, we talk about things, um, how they see their city, how they see their police department, things they want to see change. Uh, they talk, we talk about um, diversity, uh, uh, social justice, training, all these different things that go on in policing that we're having around the, around the country, um, we're doing here or we talk about with them, and they are some great, great people. Uh, one of the things, if you turn me talk about the recruit class that's getting ready to graduate, you also have these young adult police commissioners that their ages are not are not that far apart, just a couple years apart. So on March the, I think it's March the 5th, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to get these two groups together. Um, and we're going to bring in a facilitator and have some... Uh, uh, bring in a facilitator and have some people get together and talk about uh, and initiate conversation. What do young people today want to see in their police department? And what do what do these young officers, how do they feel about just getting ready to graduate and, and patrol and work in neighborhoods, um, in neighborhoods where uh, they're going to be interacting with our community, right? So my assistants here just notify me that it's not March the 5th. It'd be March the 3rd. From 3 to 5. From 3 to 5. And it was very good that they let me go down the whole road uh, two <laughs> sentences in before they, so after they thought they got their chuckles out, they decided to put it on the board and let me know. Johnny on the spot, right, when I needed to be. But yeah, so, so March 3rd. But the, the basic is that I've got uh, high school students that are uh, recruit, uh, young recruit class of officers who are getting ready to graduate, and they're going to have a facilitator come in and have a conversation about society, about policing, about our future, how we work together. And I think you've heard me talk, um, hopefully, that the more we have interaction and understand each other and listen to each other, the better that we're going to be. Um, and that, that is important. Uh, I understand school started back uh, uh, Monday, Monday of this week. Uh, so I know that's, a, you know, as we, as we ease back in, um, first I want to thank uh, Dr. Parker and all that he's done, Rashad Wright, my friend. Uh, everything you're doing with the school system and uh, the teachers that are back in. I know it's challenging and, and different, and the students back in, the parents and some uncertainties and all those things. Uh, but I, I'll tell you guys, um, I was talking about teachers yesterday. We had the youth commissioners in here yesterday. I was talking about my mother taught third grade for 30 years. And you may have heard me when I, when I went home and when I talked to her, she still talks to me like I'm still in the third grade. <laughs> But that's okay. Um, that's all right. It, uh, but the teachers are special people. You have a huge impact. Uh, I can still remember elementary, and middle, and high school teachers, and I had college professors, and, and uh, it's, that's, a, that's a great profession. It's hard. It's challenging, but it's very, very rewarding, and I appreciate what you do. I have a lot of respect for uh, people in, in the education field. As a matter of fact, uh, so when I talk about education, there was an event last night I got to go to, and I'm going to go to an event this Friday morning. Last night, I got to zoom in uh, myself, and Councilman Harris was there, and several others, and I got to watch this great presentation celebrating uh, Black History Month um, with uh, uh, Jenkins Elementary School. Those kids, it shouldn't, it, look, it, it, I was telling them last night, it should have been called Jenkins Has Talent. Those kids were amazing. They were singing, they were doing poetry, um, just, just the conversations and the comments, you know, I will tell you, uh, and, I, and I said it last night, I'll, I'll say it here again, the, the, the students, the youth of this city, they became the teachers last night. Uh, talk about unity and respect for each other and, and listening to each other and getting along together. It was just really, really, it was touching and, and they just did 
Um, the principal there, Ms. Stewart, is a, is a very good friend of mine, a uh, relationship that I met when I came here. Um, but it, that's a great school, staff there, and uh, I was just blown away uh, with what I saw and heard last night. Uh, matter of fact, tomorrow, about 7.30, I'm going to go to Jenkins and uh, say hi to my friends that are coming to school. And, you know, I know we got the social distancing, but I can certainly be be close up, up as, as I can to them and, and wave to them and just tell them to have a good day. But I want to go see them and wish them a good day on Friday and that they have a great weekend. But uh, students of Jenkins, outstanding job. You guys did great. Ms. Stewart, man, uh, um, wow. It was just a great job, Kelly. You guys did a phenomenal job. You have a great staff there. It was a great great presentation. Um, so our SROs, we've got some SROs that will be moving back into the field, back into the schools. Um, uh, we're going to get them uh, signed back over here this first first or second week of March. They'll be moving back in. I know it'll be a little different, um, but and they've been in patrol for a while, but they'll be moving back into the spending time at the high schools and middle schools as we kind of work through our time frames and, and what we've got on. Um, I understand that somehow I can tell you I didn't sign off on it, but somehow there got some information out there that somebody got a year older this year. Uh, so I understood there were a lot of uh, a lot of messages uh, saying happy birthday, and uh, so for all of you that took the time, I greatly appreciate you reminding me that I'm older. Thank you for that. But no, it was, it was a lot of, a lot of nice messages. I appreciate that. On the funny side, I went to the recruit class um, and talked to the, the the new class that started. And uh, they all stood up to attention, right? So that scared me when they all jumped up to attention right away. And then they broke into uh, the happy birthday song. And I'll tell you, it was horrible. <laughs> it was not the Supremes in there, I can tell you that. I mean, there were some people who could not carry a tune, had no business singing. You know, they should have just nodded their head. They all had their masks on, but I was like, whoa. Uh, but I appreciated the effort. Uh, but it was, I, I, it, was no, it was no high school choir, I will tell you that. But we'll maybe they'll get there someday. We all have different talents, and I appreciate it. I appreciated the gesture, uh, but it was it was something to see uh, recruits all decked out in their uniform and gear, harmonizing the happy birthday. I don't really think some of them knew the song, knew the words. Um, but I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what was cool is is talking to the class, and I wanted them to relax a little bit, get to know me, get to know the. Um, uh, department about what they're getting ready to, to step into and the training is hard it's it's you know it, it, it's it's the next seven months it's, it's tough and then after that they have three months of field training but we're gonna we're gonna in, interject some things and do some some fun things um, but I will tell you what I liked is when I went around the room and asked where you're from right there were three or four or five people from New York Syracuse uh, Brooklyn the Bronx um, there was a individual from Illinois there was an individual from right uh, Baghdad, Iraq, in our academy. There was uh, uh, two individuals from New Jersey. I had a lot of fun teasing them. Um, uh, and, and then as I went around the room, and I'm here in all these places, right? Several from Newport News, uh, some up in the Chesterfield, Richmond area. Uh, it was a, a, <laughs> a recruit. I said, where are you from? And she said, Smithville. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, long travel. Um, but... Um, but it was really good. It's a very, very diverse group. I think that's something. And here's the other thing. <clears throat> Two years ago, we decided we identified a challenge. I identified a challenge that I had in here in Newport News. There is a population in this community that I, I am not able to communicate with effectively. I'm not able to interact with and talk with as much as I would like to. We, we put in uh, two years ago that 10% um, of the recruit class that came here, right, to join the department, 10% had to speak Spanish. Now that means our recruiters had to go find individuals, right? We can't just throw out a net and we hope they apply. I need individuals. And it doesn't matter to me about race, whether it's uh, black, white, Hispanic, doesn't make any difference. But I need Spanish speakers. I need to be able to, to communicate with probably the biggest growing population we see in our city. Um, so yesterday when I asked the question, how many here speak Spanish? I will tell you, out of 24 students, out of 24 recruits, about six people raised their hand. 10%, right? 10% would have been two, two and a half or three. 20% of that class speaks Spanish. That's what I'm talking about. Now, we'll, they still have patrol duties, don't get me wrong, but we're getting, that's moving in the right direction. And we've had uh, multiple classes. Like I said, this, this class of 24, 
we have the class of 16 that come that is getting ready to come out and we got another class starting in May uh, but I still want to do more in the Hispanic uh, community <coughs> Uh, there's several neighborhoods um, that, that we walk in and the students right they get off the school bus they will come up and we'll have some conversation but some of the parents or guardians uh, kind of hang back and I don't I don't know if that is a fear of uniform or from areas that they grew up in um, but whatever barrier there is I want to find a way to break that down hurdle it get around it go through it under it if I have to, but I want to talk to them. I want them to know that this department, that this city cares about them. Uh, there is a uh, Hispanic Advisory Committee that talks to uh, our city uh, administ uh, uh, city manager, uh, Ms. Roth, and um, I had a friend join me with that meeting earlier this week, and I introduced her to them, and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to her. So just a little bit of background. Um, uh, Senorita Franco, Miss Franco, who's sitting to my left, to my left, I guess that'd be your right, right, yeah. Mike? Yeah. yeah, right mm -hmm. this way. Um, you can probably guess which one she is on the screen, right? Um, so uh, she comes to us from Ecuador. Uh, she spent eight years in the United States Navy, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Eight yes, years in the United States Navy. She went through our uh, training academy and graduated. And she was in field training, and there were some, uh, she felt some concerns about, am I being understood on the radio? And, and she said, you know, I think I want to work on this a little bit. So we assigned her to the department down here in our records division, where she interacts with citizens. And um, I'm telling you, she just has a huge heart for people. Um, she may act like she's a little nervous, but she cuts up a lot. She likes to laugh and, and, and cuts up a lot. So I've gotten to know her a little bit. Um, and I think we got some better uses for her talent. Um, she cares a lot about people, about youth. Um, so I ask her a favor. I ask her to help me bridge the gap with the Hispanic community here in Newport News. Uh, so we reassigned her temporarily on loan to Captain Tejans, the Community Youth and Outreach Division, where she's working directly for <coughs> Lieutenant Morgan. Uh, and that's our division that focuses on on, on community, doing larger events. So I asked her to join me at the uh, committee meeting last night with some of the Hispanic leaders in our community. Um, and I've asked her to join me today. So I wanted you, so I'm going to talk a lot about her and things that we're trying to do in this department in our, in our community. Um, so I wanted you to be able to put a face with a name. I didn't want you to think, she's just throwing somebody out there, we don't know. So I'm gonna ask Ms. Franco to say hello um, she may tell you a little bit of, about her background, but I, I, I will tell you I am I am very encouraged and excited about some things that we're going to be able to do. She may tell you about some things that she's done, some walks and some translations already. Um, but I think she's going to, to it, it's going to give us an opportunity to have a true commitment, right? A true commitment to the uh, Hispanic population in our city, and it, um, and I've been committed to do something and try to find the right fit. Um, and I think we're going to, I think we're heading in the right direction. So I'm really excited. So, um, Ms. Franco, if you'd like to say hello, I know it's a little different. It took me a while to get used to talking into mm -hmm. this round ball, but uh, uh, hopefully there's some people out there watching and, and can hear us. So please just say hello to our, our fan club. Hola. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, como esto es un foro hispano, voy a hablar en español. Um, querida comunidad latina um, de Newport News, me llamo Soraya Franco. Eh, nací en Guayaquil, Ecuador, una de las ciudades más importantes de Ecuador. Vine a la edad de 8 años, uh, disculpen, de 12 años <ríe> con mi familia. Um, tengo en la actualidad dos uh, niñas, una de 13 y una de 5 años. Now do me a favor. What does all that mean in English? <laughs> <laughs> or you know what? Maybe I'll maybe every, maybe there, maybe maybe everyone out there, right? Maybe everyone out there thinks I understood. But tell right. me tell me for the for the English uh, speakers that are with us. Tell all tell right. them what you just said in, okay. in English. Okay. Um, I said uh, my community, uh, my Latin community, the Newport News. Uh, my name is Soraya Franco, and I was born in Guayaquil, Ecuador one of the most important cities in uh, South America, in Ecuador, of course, in South America. 
Um, I came here at the age of 12 with my, my family. Um, in the present moment, I'm a mother of two, a 13-year-old and a uh, five-year-old. That's like hazardous pay right there, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and and you, were in the, you were in the Navy? Yes, I was in the military for eight years. I did four years in uh, Washington State, um, Bremerton. And uh, after that, I did uh, four years in as a reservist in the Bronx, uh, the MIUW-203, if anybody's listening to this and belongs to that unit, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my, I always wanted to help. I always see myself in the future uh, helping the community. It's something that I, I would love. Like, I always wanted to try and do, but I never had the chance to kind of do it because various reasons or you know anything that happened in the past uh, and um, I decided to go and apply for to become a police officer because I thought that, that was a good idea to kind of get involved with the community and everything that they do here um, okay so <laughs> right now I was called by chief of police uh, to um, to try this new... Um, I said we call it an adventure, what do you think? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> right. Um, to try this new project that he had in mind, um, and I accept happily. Uh, I think it will give the chance uh, to the Hispanic community to get to know a little bit of what the police oh. family do and what is actually trying to do for the community. Um, I think it's very important because, um, like he said, the most, the biggest um, community that is uh, is growing right now is the, is, is the uh, Latin community. So, and we are like, we are a lot of Latinos out there. You guys know, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have been called to collaborate in this and uh, it's called the Community and uh, Youth uh, Outreach for the Latin uh, Population. Um, our chief of police is very adamant about, you know, helping the Latino community. And he has a passion, just, just a passion overall to help everybody. But now he wants to, he would like to help uh, the Latino because like I said before, and not to be redundant, but you know, it's growing a uh, very fast paced. Um, this project is focuses on open the community, the open the uh, communications, and uh, um, you know have a little closer relationship with yeah. the uh, police, um, especially for the Latinos. Um, like he said, there's not that many people that speak actually speak the uh, Spanish language out there. And if we do have it, we do have it in, uh, you know, that not that many people actually speak um, the, the Spanish language. Um, you know, it's just, it's just going to bring an added element. So, yeah, you know, it's going to be, with, with it's gonna be and, better, I think, yes. because, you know, it's going to be, able, we're going to be able to help a lot of people, and I'm really excited actually about that. <laughs> um, so, um, certainly very to, happy to be here. and uh, Certainly more to follow, right? Right, right. Very yeah, good. Very yeah, yeah. So, so Jamie, we're tell here me to help you. So, so Jamie, I'm not seeing the messages. Is it is it the system? Are you getting? The, are the messages coming in or, or no? I can see them on my end. Um, so I'm going to read some to you, and it looks like we have so finally before, started getting some. So in. listen, before Jamie starts reading, so it's probably a computer glitch on 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 her end. It's not me. I'm not touching <laughs> anything. I haven't kicked anything. She doesn't allow me to touch anything. So just because I'm not seeing the screens so here, stuff at right? <laughs> I know stuff is coming through, so Jamie's going to read a couple to me. Um, so it may just be the hookup with the computer. So I apologize. Um, so if there's any anything that we don't get to, uh, we'll we'll certainly respond back uh, offline to make sure we answer your questions. Okay. So Richard says, "Good afternoon, Chief um, Price, who's on here um, almost sure. every month, says that you guys share the same birthday." Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Michael says, "Happy birthday, Chief. Keep up the good work." Ellen says, "Happy birthday, blessings." Debbie Dowdy, happy birthday. Lots of happy birthday wishes. Um, we have one from Shelby that asks what happened a few Friday nights ago in Newmarket um, around 11 o'clock. And then this is her follow-up. A few weeks ago, it was on a Friday night. 
Yes. Yeah, so um, up up in Newmarket, there was a uh, individual in a vehicle uh, um, uh, when officers found them uh, uh, deceased, uh, but it was a natural death. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, there was no foul play, no trauma associated. Um, it, was, it was a natural death that we would have responded to. But that you're exactly right. Um, matter of fact, that reports on my desk that I, I, I when I was gone, I was, things I was reading reading back through. But that was a um, that was a uh, a natural death that occurred there. So there was. That's why you saw officers responding because they weren't sure originally until they were able to determine what happened and, and uh, medical people, medical personnel arrived. And after that, a few more birthday wishes. Birthday wishes. Yeah, so <laughs> look, I will tell you, uh, it was really nice. The the officers here and, and uh, individuals up upstairs and the, the chiefs, they all, they, they all tease me uh, about getting older. Um, but that's all right, you know. It's, it all comes back around. I just got to get through that day, and then I can then I can tease others. But I really appreciate the citizens. I got a lot of nice emails and comments, and I, I did not know. Um, matter of fact, one of our officers had had baked that cake that if he saw that that was behind me, and uh, so I wanted to take a picture with me and the cake and and just tell him thank you. So I'm not sure how that got out. When I figure out how to work this Facebook stuff, I'm going to figure out how it did, right? <laughs> Uh, well, once I figured it out, but uh, I, when I heard about all these messages coming through, I, I was like, wow, really? We so I was, I was really, I was very, 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 very appreciative and thankful. Let, 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 me, let me say this. Um, there's a lot of things going on around the country today and a lot of talk about reimagining police and how do we get better. Um, but I'll tell you, we have those conversations just about every day in this department. Every Monday at one o'clock, the, the leadership team, the, all the captains, um, Several of the lieutenants, uh, sworn and civilian both, we sit down and talk about what happened the week before, what happened, what we got this week, and what are things going on in our community and around the country, and how do we get better? Then every Thursday we sit down for two hours and we hear crime presentations. What are what are neighborhoods experiencing? What do the crime numbers look like? What are our overdoses look like? Are we having more suicides? What were our suicides this year compared to last year? Crime up or down? And I don't want to ever be misconstrued. Some people ask me, Chief, why do you look so much at those numbers? Let me be clear. Every one of those numbers is an incident. It's a family. It's a neighborhood. It's a community. I don't lose track of that. But the reason we look at being evidence-based and data-driven is because it allows me to look at what we have and measure it. Is it working? So I said earlier that the city right now is down. Last year, we ended the year with a 14% re crime reduction. Today, the city's down 25% compared to where we were this same time last year. So I'm looking at those strategies that seem to be right now giving us some results that we're looking for. But if that, if we change, right, if the, if the crime started to rise, then I've got to tweak those strategies. And what we look by, uh, it, what strategies may be working in the north part of the city may not work in the south or may not work in the central. And things that are working in the south, we may want to implement that, those strategies in the north and the central. So it allows us to look at our initiatives, look at what we have, look at our, our, our manpower, our calls for service, our citizen complaints. Um, where are we at and how are we doing? And that makes a world of, of difference. So that's why I look at those numbers to measure them. But I, I never lose track that, that those are individuals. I mean, completely get that. Um, we met at the uh, end of January and went over our balanced scorecard. All the goals that we set for 2021, we are we, – we, we looked at those and where did we finish? Above, did we meet or did we fall short? And then we set our goals for, for 2022, what we want to focus on, right? This year we're really going to focus a lot on technology, focus a lot on training. Uh, we now have 10 instructors that can teach implicit bias training to our officers. So I don't have to send five or six officers away to training. I now have 10 instructors here who are certified to teach the 465 men and women of this department. That's a game changer for us. My commitment is to have every officer field trained in implicit bias training, recognize what implicit bias is, that all of us have biases, but to help us to find ways to quickly identify them and not allow them to influence the decisions we make and how we treat the citizens of this city. That every officer will be trained by the end of the year. You got some more questions coming I do. through? Okay. Michael um, is wondering if you know, it's a two part. Um, two part question. Uh -huh. Do you know the completion date for the Denby Bridge overpass? I, I he do. said, "If you don't know, that's Michael. I absolutely, I, I do know, do not. I apologize, but I will tell you. I probably get an answer to you. It might take me a little bit longer than right after we get off here, but uh, we, I certainly can call engineering and get an answer for you. At least a ballpark idea." And the second part is, um, 
Hope you didn't try to do the electric slope on your birthday. <laughs> no, <laughs> Michael. It's okay. It's all right. Everybody's got jokes. <laughs> So, Ms. Franco, uh, you know, one time I go to a community event, I get invited to come up and do the uh, this <laughs> dance. I'm not sure the name of it. I tried it, <laughs> right? Like Encourage, like and, and then uh, and then I get made fun of. But it's all right. Uh, you know what? <laughs> I will tell you this: my nieces and nephews, they give me a thumbs up on it. They're like five, six, and seven. And they said I had some moves. <laughs> they had some moves. They had some moves, but. Uh, no, I, I did not. I took it very easy. I, I was here at work, and uh, I got razzed all day long, but that's all right. You know what? It's it's good to laugh, and I'm very, very blessed to work in an organization where we can, where we can like a family, right, that we come together and address some issues, and, and um, yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you, Michael. Um, Charles says that it's starting to warm up, and Chief Charlie is wanting to play soccer at headquarters. Time flies. It will be one year in June since his accident. You were doing a fantastic job. Yeah, well, listen, my friend, Charlie, I, look, I remember coming to see you, and uh, you've undergone a lot, my friend. It's hard to believe it's been a year. But I'll tell you this. I remember laying down a challenge to you. So we're going to get some goalies, some goals, right? Goals? Goalies. Goals. goals. Yeah, it's goals. not hockey. We're going to get some goals, my friend. Some nets. <laughs> and we're going to put them out here in the front lawn of headquarters, and you and I are going to do one-on-one. <laughs> or we're going to do maybe like, what, what do That's they call funny. it? I'm not a soccer guy. It's like penalty penalty kicks, right? You be the goalie. I'm going to try to shoot five I soccer balls through you. Or you're going to, I'll be the goalie. You try to shoot five soccer balls through me. And we'll we'll uh, we'll break it down right here at police headquarters on a little soccer. Uh, uh, you're a soccer fan? I love soccer. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I'm I got, good at playing too. I got, I got two left feet, but I'm going to challenge, I challenge my friend Charlie. So. <laughs> Charlie, you let me know. We, we got to do it warm, though. I can't be doing it with no hard ground out there in the cold weather. Um, I'm older now, right, as a lot of people decide to point out. But, um, no, yeah, I'm looking forward to playing. But, Charlie, in all, all seriousness, buddy, I, I'm thinking about you, and I can't wait to see you. And, uh, man, I'm proud of you, my friend. I'm proud of you. Rhonda says, happy birthday, Chief. My daughter, Tanya Elaine Crosby, is a nie niece of the late Chief Leroy Crosby of Hampton. She and her brother have wow. followed in his footsteps are in and are in law enforcement now, one with Henrico County and the other with VCU campus. Have a wonderful birthday wow. and stay safe. Wow. Thank you very much. That, that's amazing. Uh, those are both great, great entities, and I want to thank you for his service. Um, you know, I, I, want, I should have on something else, Jamie. We got any other questions? Any There's other? one more. Go ahead and hit that and then remind me I want to talk about uh, Chief Austin for a minute. From Annette. She says, you have an amazing heart for people and for this city. Thank you for all you do. I was ready to move out of this area due to surrounding gangs, shootings, and just never knowing what is going to happen next. I am raising a teenage son and he is my main focus. Since you have taken time to do this every month, it has really given me hope. Thank you. That's from Annette. That's a nice one. Annette, I, I, uh, I appreciate that. You know, I, I know there's challenges and things are hard and people get frustrated. Um, I totally get it. But I think the best the best asset that I have in this department, you know, with all the technology and the, the different things that we have, the best asset I have are the men and women who come to work here every day. They're very special people. And, and regardless, crime goes up, crime goes down, things change, situations happen, and we respond to them. We can do all the training in the world. I can teach people how to write reports. I can uh, teach people how to respond. We can go over uh, crime scenes, all those different things. But I'll tell you, what I cannot teach people is to have a heart for people and the humanity uh, that we need in this profession. And I believe that starts at the top, that I set the tone for that. How I treat the men and women that work here, I can be hard on them at times. That doesn't mean I want a bunch of officers emailing me right now telling me, yeah, hey, Chief, I can be hard on them at times, but I do that to push them to go beyond what they think they can accomplish, to do more, to give more. Um, but I will tell you, I wouldn't trade any of them for anything in the world. I love the men and women that work here, sworn and civilian both. That uh, I see the time and that they miss from their families, um, that they miss from the uh, birthday parties, uh, ballets, recitals, sporting events. Uh, I uh, that work through the night when most of us are home asleep. Uh, to come in on the weekends, those that are off with their families and something happens in our city and they come back in away from that. That's special. And then there's a lot of criticism about this profession right now. So I'd have to ask, why do I have 16 people that are graduating, another 24 that want to come here and work, and I'm already getting applications for the class that will start in May? It's because this is a hard profession, but it is extremely rewarding. 
one that will not be measured in arrest and summonses or citations, but one will be arrest. One will be measured by the effects that we have on individuals. The ability that every day we wake up, we have the ability to help somebody, and that that is an immeasurable. You can't measure that, right? Um, but I think that starts at the top. I think you have to have a heart for people to do this job. That's the way that I was raised, my faith. Um, uh, but people matter. Uh, the people in this community and the men and women that I work with, um, they matter to me. And I, try, I do try to run the department like a family. We may not always agree. I can guarantee you we don't always agree. But I see the commitment that they have, and, and, and I try to, to push that. Focus on our youth of the city. Focus on our citizens, our neighborhoods. Our, uh, our, our businesses go out of your way you'll hear me uh, on graduation day when the recruits I'll ask one recruit to stand up and I challenge them with, with all the different things that they'll do I, I, to do 25 years here I ask them to do one thing for me 5, 10, 15 minutes every day they come to work I don't care if it's 5 minutes or 30 minutes but every day have a positive interaction with the youth in this city every day and that will be extremely rewarding you know, as we close out February, I can't believe we're, we're uh, getting ready to start March already. I thought we just had Thanksgiving like last week. Uh, but this is Black History Month, and I told you I got to spend some time with Jenkins Elementary School, the, the fifth grade class, and the presentation they put on. But um, talked a little bit about it here. I do I do some videos uh, that we send out to the officers just so I, they can hear things from me, try to squash rumors that go around. What are we doing here? What are, um, but I talked a little bit. I never met the man. Never, I never met him. I've done some reading on him, and I have talked to several citizens who uh, still remember him. Um, but um, Chief George Austin, um, he uh, joined the department in 1947, just three years after the end of World War II. He rose through the ranks, and he was the first African American lieutenant in the state of Virginia. He continued to rise through the ranks, and he he was the first uh, African-American chief, only African-American chief here in Newport News. When he joined the department back in 1947, uh, he was one of three individuals. And he was on a walking beat. He wasn't allowed to drive a car. And he was only allowed to walk in certain areas of the city. Uh, the, the beats or the uh, areas or districts were segregated then. Um, but the reading that I've done on, on Chief Austin and, and uh, people in the community that knew him uh, talk about uh, that he cared about people, that it, it wasn't a, a color to him. It was that he cared about people. Um, so he, I think he left a lasting legacy on this department. Uh, his picture hangs outside my office in the, in the hallway. And uh, the other day I walked by and I was just looking at it. And he was the chief here from 1975 to 1983. In fact, he hired Chief Grinstead in 1981. Now, I tease Chief Grinstead all the time. So if he tunes in, you now I'm teasing him again, but he, he was hired by Chief Austin, and they had a very, very strong relationship. Even after Chief Austin retired, uh, Chief Grinstead remained very, very close to him and his family, uh, even when he had gotten sick, spent some time with him in the hospital. But um, Black History Month, every contribution that is made is valuable. But he is one that... that I would try to emulate um, and through history can be a mentor to me about making sure that we care and show compassion to people. Um, so for his family, um, I just I appreciate um, everything that Chief Austin did, the struggles that he uh, that he faced in this profession, his uh, perseverance and to rise to the rank of chief of police in this organization. That's phenomenal. Um, and everything, everything I hear about him is just an, an outstanding individual and a great leader. So I appreciate, sir, um, to your family, the contribution that you made to this, this community and this department. I appreciate you. We got anything else, Jamie? Mm -hmm. So, um, it, yes, yeah, so we'll try to get the computer glitch uh, fixed. We're going to do this again tonight at, at six, uh, 6 this evening. Yeah. Um, some things as we go forward, uh, like I said, we're going to spend a lot of time on, uh, a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of money on training and technology uh, this year. There's a lot of new laws that are taking place, some changes in, in, in police work, changes with uh, uh, search warrants, um, are, are making sure we're capturing data on our traffic stops. Uh, matter of fact, I think there's a class, some new laws, there's a class today, and I think one more either this week or next week that'll 
Uh, then we'll have everybody trained on the new laws that will come out. That's important. Um, we're looking at other bills that are on the governor's desk that whether he signs or not, that, that will, that will uh, have some impact, some larger and some smaller on, on law enforcement. We're going to continue um, our training. I sat through some autism training the other day. It was very beneficial to me. Um, uh, Detective Hauser did a, 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 an excellent job talking about the uh, Project Guardian that we have here, about a, a registry if people want to um, have members of their family that are, that are, that are some challenges with autism, that they can put on a registry here so that if officers get a call to that particular address, they know they may encounter someone who has autism and, and some different signs and different reactions that people have. I just think that's very, very beneficial. And when I talk about technology, those are some of the things that I talk about. All the different apps that are coming out uh, that we can put on cell phones, and, and some is kind of futuristic, but that they're in the works where we can talk on our, our cell phone and it will populate an offense report or an incident report for us. Um, that we're able to record conversations, showing photo lineups. Uh, there's just a lot of a lot of a lot of things, technology that that uh, advances that I want to get ahead of. So we're spending some time on infrastructure uh, here in our department uh, to help us to do better. Right? How do we do better? Um, we implemented a, a, a whole new week in the academy about conversations, and we're bringing people from outside and experts that we have inside the department who who uh, can help us and help officers talk to people. Uh, you know, I'm going to tell the recruit class, and I talked to them when I met them this week, that I would go around the room and who wants to go where? What are your aspirations and someone? I want to be a narcotics detective. I want to be a traffic. Uh, I want to be a traffic division. I want to do special victims. I want to work with missing persons, domestic violence. You know, I want to be a homicide detective, and I want to work in patrol in these areas. You know, wherever. Uh, I can tell you, the people that are sought after, it's not who has the highest grade point average in the class. It's not the best pursuit driver. It's not the person who's the best marksman. Now, all those things are important, and I'm not taking anything away from them. But I will tell you, what people are looking for are individuals who know how to talk to people. They can sit across and, and, and conduct an interview or investigation and get valuable parts and pieces to, to cases or to situations uh, that, occur, that, occur, that occur uh, and be able to put pieces of that puzzle together to solve crime, bring some closure to families, to get information from citizens about uh, crime that's going on in their neighborhood. How we talk to people matters. How we interact with people matters. Um, I'll give a little bit away in our, our training. Um, our academy staff started last year and then incorporated it this year, not only with our recruit class, but also our in-service, right? So with myself, the chief, and we have to have the state mandates that we have 20 hours of in-service every year. Here in Newport News Police Department, we do 40 hours of in-service. One of the things that they incorporated uh, last year and, and, and this year is we talked about the duty to intervene. It is not just something we talk about, a PowerPoint presentation or the read on a policy. We incorporated some of the scenarios. So uh, we actually have the situations uh, role playing, if you will, right, uh, where officers will we tell them a scenario they're going to respond to, a, a citizen complaint, uh, something, maybe uh, an argument going on in the street. And uh, so they go through the doors and they walk in and they're in the scenario, right? And, and uh, you, may, you will see an, one officer um, being disrespectful to a citizen. And what we want to measure is, what we want to see is, how do those new recruits or how do officers come out and interact with that? And then we even throw some curveballs. So I'm giving away some training things, right? But we even threw some curveballs that we used um, senior officers as well, meaning leadership officers, right? So I may have a lieutenant in that scenario. And I want to go interact with the recruits. I want to interact with their officers too. So even I want to go through that that training where, where maybe I'm, I'm, I'm having a talk with a citizen and I want to see how... Uh, a recruit or an officer, would, if, they're, if they will do the right thing and stand up and say, Chief, Assistant Chief, Captain, let, let, let me handle this situation. We're all, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Um, we all make mistakes, right? The part where leadership for me that comes into that is how we address it after it happens. What corrective action do we use? Reviewing our, our, our policies, we reinforce our training, look at ourselves at how do we do better, be open and transparent. Um, it's okay for us to say we're sorry. It's okay for us to apologize. It's okay for us to admit when we didn't do the right thing or we got it wrong and that we can do better. I think that that is, is what leadership is in this profession. And I think that we can do that uh, and, and push that down and, and into our officers in the community and even for senior officers and, and including the chief of police to make sure that we respect the, the citizens. Um, those things are important. 
Jamie, we got any other comments? Um, Annette made another comment. She says, you have changed my perspective on law enforcement. I always had a fear of cops, but you have helped reshape that. Well, uh, Annette, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's amazing, you know, all the all the different tools we have, right? Uh, whether it's a taser or a baton or OC spray, handcuffs, whatever. Um, the best tool we have is, is our presence, maybe a smile on how we talk to people. Uh, I think we can uh, really see a lot of de-escalation that way. It's another thing that we're teaching in the academy and working on is de-escalation. Tensions are high. Got to be able to take a step back in conversations. Um, as a matter as a matter of fact, um, fr tomorrow, tomorrow's Friday, right? Tomorrow, we have our use of force review board. Um, I reviewed the uh, videos today, unedited. I just reviewed them today. So if you didn't know, um, 465 officers, all of us have body-worn cameras, most of them are mounted in the center of our chest. We're to turn them on every time we have a citizen interaction. Um, we average about seven or eight use of force a month, uh, and we have a use of force review board. That use of force review board is made up of an officer, a sergeant, a lieutenant, and a captain, and then four citizens. So it's four and four. If those groups, they will see the body-worn footage, they'll, unedited, they will see it. Um, and then they discuss it and they will vote that the actions of the officer were reasonable and in policy, the actions of the officer were not in policy, or the actions of the officer were, were reasonable and understandable. But, you know, here's some things we might want to look at in training of how we can do better. If there is a deadlock, if it's two officers and two citizens versus two citizens and two officers, um, there is no tiebreaker. If it is tied, it goes back to internal affairs and they will talk with the Commonwealth attorney and review it to see if the officer's actions were inappropriate. The reason I have this panel is I think uh, I don't think it would be good if we just did it all police, and I don't think it'd be good if we just did it all civilian. I think there has to be a a conversation and collaboration and work together. I think that's how we will move forward. I think it's good for officers to hear questions citizens have, and I think it's good for citizens to hear what's going on through the officer's mind. We allow the officers who used the force or had the incident to come in and talk about why they did what they did. Um, and a use of force is, is anything other than normal handcuffing techniques. So just for a quick example, if, uh, if someone pulled me over and I had a warrant on file, and they tell me I have a warrant on file and I step out of the car and they handcuff me, it ends there. But if I step out of the car and I take off running and they tackle me, that would be a use of force. If I step out of the car and I punch them and we started fighting, they, they struck me back, that would be a use of force. If they use their OC spray or their aspiton or their taser, that's a use of force. And we report that ourselves. If I get out of the car and fall down and the officer never touches me, they would probably still do a use of force because there's an injury while you're in interaction with an officer. If I step out of the car and uh, there's a struggle, um, I fall down and scrape my knee and I say I'm fine, the officer's still gonna do a use of force and take, us, take me to the hospital to get me checked out before I'm taken down to see the magistrate. So all those things we will see tomorrow. We average about, uh, like I said, about seven or eight a month. So the ones we'll see tomorrow in February are the uses of force incidents in January. And we do it every month. And we have a group of citizens that come through. I ask that the citizens um, do go through a Citizens Academy. We have a pool of about 200 individuals over the years. Um, because if you go through that Citizens Academy, you, you get some training on what use of force is, what is the law, here's our policy instead of just individuals off the street who don't, who, who don't know what those uh, parameters are. But some may say, well, I would like to know what use of force is and how the police department use it, but I don't know that I want to go through a citizen's academy. We address that too. Uh, tomorrow, I believe we have one councilman and two or three citizens just coming to observe. Um, I also have in the, the side of the room, there is uh, members from our training academy. So if you have a question, what is OC spray? Why did you use the taser? Um, why, why did you place that individual in handcuffs? They're able to explain to you what our training practices are. Um, internal affairs is also in the room. If we see something that we need to address, they're able to document that. But they will see, the citizens and the officers there will see the, the, uh, the body-worn camera footage of that incident unedited. Um, and I think that has been very, very valuable. And I enjoy going up after and talking to the citizens um, sir, what is it you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. Ma'am, uh, I'm an activist. Um, I remember talking to one, one, 
one uh, young lady and she said, you know, I'm going to go back and talk to my students. That it's not what you hear rumors about. And, and I said, your students, what are you doing? She said, I'm assistant principal at, at one of our high schools here. And I think, wow, that's impressive. You know, that's really cool. So, uh, and I also talked to the officers. How is it for you? And, and the officers talk about, it's good to hear some of the questions and concerns citizens have. And I will tell you, there's been two or three recommendations that have come out of that review board that we have implemented in our training. I think it's important, it's valuable. So when you bring people together and collaborate, I think you can really do some, some great things. So we're getting up to about almost 1 o'clock. Um, I don't want to hold people too long. Jamie, have I missed any comments? Uh, um, yes, Miss Adley says, sure. um, thanks, uh, Adley Spratley is the name, is um, thanks for all you, the officers and civilians, do. Um, and Jeff Richardson says, you guys are awesome. Keep doing a great job for Newport News. Well, Miss Spratley, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Jeff, I appreciate you. Thanks for tuning in today. And I'm sorry we had a little bit of a glitch here that we're having to go through through Jamie to read read them to me. Probably a little bit better. Sometimes when I look at them, these old eyes, you know, I get I get the words wrong. But uh, <laughs> so it's good to have her here to 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 to, to check mm -hmm. check on me. And Lieutenant Morgan said, especially the names. I, I, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. It's all right. I can take it. Um, I will tell you though, I am. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. I'm excited about is I'm get, we're getting ready to do some things. With the Boys and Girls Club, you know, as we get through COVID, some restrictions get lifted. Uh, I'm really, man, I miss interacting with those kids at the clubs, uh, whether it's basketball tournament that we have and, 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 and going by and spending time with them. Uh, we did three three basketball seasons. Uh, and, and then not to mention the big sport of kickball right here. And uh, we got we had we got some challenges uh, and we had a lot. We had a lot of fun. Uh, let me tell you, them kids take kickball stuff serious around here. <laughs> let me tell you, that stuff serious. Uh, I umpired one game, and I, I tell you what, I, had to, I don't know how to throw some kids out of the game, right? But you know, you know what else? I just tell them to throw officers out of the game, telling me they were safe at first base. Out, but Jason Bullhurst was out by two feet, telling me he was safe at first base. Captain Bullhurst, come on, they had you. That young man had you. Uh, but we had a lot of fun, right? And then I got Morgan Tejans and. And, and others flipping hamburgers and hot dogs and hanging out. Um, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, how they've got a new uh, uh, angel has has moved on. My friend, uh, she is down in New Orleans, uh, New New Orleans, right? Uh, Cajun New territory, Orleans. New Orleans, no. right? No. But I got to talk to her the other day. She is doing great. Uh, my friend Rob Coleman has filled in, taking her spot, and uh, I got to talk to Rob yesterday. I'm I'm really looking side excited. And forward to doing some new things with the, the Boys and Girls Club. I think it's going to be a great fit. And um, I know our officers like um, hanging out with the kids too. You know, we realize we might be able to run as fast and wake up a lot sore than we were before the, the next day. But uh, I really have a lot. We really have a lot of fun. And you know, I just I'll say this before I sign off. If we don't have any other questions, um, we did a kickball thing over the summer, uh, towards the end of the summer, I guess. And um, uh, I just asked for some officers, if you want to come out and play, come out and play. I'll tell you, we had about 44 officers showed up. And that's what I'm talking about. That's people who care about this community and care about youth. And you can't buy that. I didn't order them to come out. They chose to come out on their own. And we had a great time. Uh, we played at um, uh, the, the South. Over by South Morrison. Mm -hmm. the, the field there at South Morrison. Trisha and Dresden Lane over there. We had a, we had a great time. Um, yeah, it was great. Uh, Chief Grinstead and I took care of umpiring the games, and we had, we had a lot of fun teasing people and uh, making some close calls. It was good. So, uh, Jamie, anything else? I don't want to miss anybody. One last one from yep. Juanita. It says, what about domestic dispute complaints on private par property? And then in parentheses, she, she has yep. mobile home park. Yeah, I, I, so let's talk about domestics real quick. You know, we have two domestic violence advocates that we hired. Uh, we have got a lot of interest from people around the country about how we do that. Uh, we're actually working with our Commonwealth attorney and our defense attorneys as well to make sure that we get the best training we can for those individuals and, and individuals in our domestic violent unit. I think that's going to continue to grow. To answer your question, it doesn't matter to me where domestic violence occurs at. Private property, public, home, it doesn't matter. Domestic violence is domestic violence, and we're going to respond to it. Um, it's one of the harder things for officers to deal with. It's one of the harder things for us to decrease, and I will tell you, the one crime I have not been able to make an impact on, the one offense, has been domestic situations. They have gone up the last three years. And I know in this COVID environment, with, with uh, issues with schools, uh, or their kids going to school, uh, businesses closing down, restricted hours, being confined, 
Um, I think that's led to a, some of the domestics that we've seen. Um, but I do say this, we are treating our victims much, much better. Uh, Cheryl and Nisha have really taught us about when we respond to a domestic, when we walk through that door, our, the way we carry ourselves sets the whole tone for what's going to happen in those interactions. Um, they, are, they are really, they have taught this department, they're working with our citizens, they're working with our youth. They came out and worked with the young adult police commissioners about teen dating and teen violence. Uh, it's just very, very valuable. And there's departments all over the country that have called and asked how that's working out. Uh, and I think it's phenomenal. I think it's going to continue to grow. I'm 100% committed to it. We make about 95% clearance rate on a domestic case because usually the victim is, is known and is there when we arrive. Um, but I have not seen the decrease that I want to see. And it's hard because so often it happens behind closed doors or behind closed walls and officers patrolling a neighborhood won't see it. However, those individuals who suffer from domestic violence or find themselves victimized, male or female, um, oftentimes they will show signs in people who work with them or they will confide in people um, or individuals who live next door may hear things. My ask is to citizens, if you see it or if you hear it, regardless of where it is, that you would call and report it. I would much rather, I would much rather um, officers show up and find out it's just a uh, uh, people playing around or kids wrestling, watching uh, world wrestling, right? Um, Ric Flair and Dusty Road to do their thing in the living room, right? And the kids are playing around, having a good time, and it'd be nothing as opposed to as opposed to not going to that call and somebody getting hurt. Uh, so I, I really appreciate citizens who get involved, but domestic violence doesn't matter where it occurs. If, if it's a domestic violence situation, we're responding. So Juanita has a follow-up comment. Yes. She says they respond, but they take no action against the couple for their arguing and vulgar language. Yeah, so there are very, very strict laws. Um, um, if there is a physical sign of an attack or an abuse, if there is uh, the aggressor is usually the one that is arrested, um, uh, and it has to be reported and documented, and bringing Cheryl and Nisha on, we do follow-up. So you may not see, you know, look, if there's verbal abuse and arguing and yelling at each other, there's technically not a crime that has been committed if it's husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, people who live together. And oftentimes, if neither one want to press charges about that, there, what crime has been committed, right? But I would agree that if that's going on, it is very possible that domestic violence may occur after we leave or has occurred uh, earlier, prior, whatever. Um, so if there's no physical signs and if no one is saying they hit each other, if no, there are no victim identifies, uh, it does, it makes it very difficult. Uh, but what I will tell you on the back end is since Cheryl and Nisha have been on board, uh, we are having our advocates call individuals back and check on them. Sometimes they may not want to have a conversation with people around or officers there, but they might have that conversation later. So there are some very, very challenging points. There's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. Uh, but if, an, if officers arrive to a scene where someone has been assaulted in a domestic situation, they are required to make an arrest. Um, the last one is Deborah Stokes wishes you a happy belated birthday. Deborah, thank you very much. I appreciate all the, uh, the warm uh, sentiment about uh, me getting a year older. Thank you guys so much, uh, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, like I said, we're going to do this again at 6 o'clock this evening. Um, and I know it's hard, right, uh, especially with COVID and time restraints, all the different things people have going on. Um, but if you get a chance to look, I hope we hit some of the topics that you're interested in. Our annual report will be out probably at the uh, uh, next next week or two. We'll have that uploaded on our uh, uh, our Facebook page or, or website, Facebook. website mm -hmm. and as well. Uh, we'll have some hard copies here. Uh, but that gives you a kind of a snapshot of everything we did last year, um, crime-wise, community-wise, uh, youth-wise, training-wise, things that we're focused on and things that we're focused on this year to come. Uh, so COVID has certainly issued us some challenges, but I could not be more proud of the men and women uh, sworn in civilian both that work here, our dispatchers, our individuals in forensics, the work that they, they, they've they done. We had our budget hearing with the city manager and several of the budget committee um, and laid out some things that we want to do as far as training and technology and enhancements to the department. Um, and I just appreciate the support that um, and the community willing to work with us. So, like I said, I'm um, sorry to go over. Uh, we'll do this again at 6 o'clock this evening, and uh, I really appreciate you all. Thank you very much. God bless. Uh, myself and Ms. Franco will talk Thank to you, you later. Take care.
Bye-bye.